Welcome to Design Through Time, the costumes of Maya's C. Rubio, presented by the Costume Designers Guild in partnership with Milton Eadie's Dry Cleaners and Tailoring Center. If you're watching on a larger screen, please go to the settings at the bottom of your player window and choose either 1080p or 720p so that you have the best possible viewing experience. And now, Design Through Time, the costumes of Maya's C. Rubio. Moderated by fashion historian Summer Lee. Of death. Man, he's a he's a fighter. Most loyal little Nazi I've ever met. Wanda. Is it about the way I'm dressed? Yes. Welcome to Design Through Time, the costumes of Maya C. Rubio and today's conversation with the legendary Maya C. Rubio. I'm Summer Lee. I'm a fashion historian and an educational content creator on social media, where I often discuss costume design in film, television, and theater because it really inspires people to learn about dress and ask questions about fashion history. And I have certainly been asked questions questions about productions where Mayas was the costume designer. So among the films she has worked on are Avatar, Apocalypto, The Great Wall, Thor Ragnarok, Jojo Rabbit, and also the recent Marvel series WandaVision. For her work on Jojo Rabbit, she won a Costume Designers Guild Award and was nominated for a Costumes Oscar. And WandaVision was just recently nominated for a whopping 23 Emmys, including for costume design. So congratulations, Mayas, and we are so happy to have you join us today. Thank you for having me. This is really, uh, you know, I pinch myself every day after you know, the news from the 23 incredible nominations for WandaVision. Um, it's, uh, I'm very happy about it. I'm very happy to be here. Yeah, so first I just wanted to congratulate you and ask you how it felt to learn that you were nominated for um, an Emmy for your work on WandaVision. Well, it was uh, it was very surprising because you know I'm in Italy right now, and uh, you know time difference. Uh, it, it it really happened in a, in the time of the day in where I was you know awake, and uh, I think it was my afternoon, and my nephew and my niece uh, ran to me, uh, and they said, um, you know, you've been nominated. It has been really, really amazing since then. And then all the emails started to roll in from uh, the creators, the director, the producers, my uh, adored 
costume designers, uh, assistants, and uh, everybody. And um, it, we put so much heart into this uh, show that it, it really is paid off just just for having all these, uh, uh, you know, knots and uh, denominations. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> what an amazing story. So yeah. I want to ask you sort of about your inspirations, your early inspirations into getting into costume design. So regarding WandaVision, you've previously spoken about how you grew up watching so many of those TV sitcoms that were referenced in WandaVision that you were able to bring your knowledge and your nostalgia for those shows into your design. So I'm curious, would you say that programs like that, like I Love Lucy, The Dick Van Dyke Show, and The Brady Bunch were some of your inspirations to get into costume design? Or if not, um, what productions would you say inspired you? Definitely. Uh, I mean, they, they took a big part of my childhood and, uh, you know, uh, young adult, adult life in uh, Mexico. Um, these kind of sitcoms always existed since, uh, since I have, you know, use of knowledge of television. I grew up with uh, I Love Lucy, the Brady Bunch, the... Patrick's family, on and on and on. You know, all of these sitcoms were really, you know, a great fun thing to watch uh, when I was little. They um, they influenced me uh, more than you know my career. They really took a big part of my research in uh, Wonder Vision because that was the whole idea. Yeah. You know, Wanda was making uh, you know this parallel world based on sitcoms, which she also watched uh, when she was a child in Sokovia. We all took a leap on uh, what to research from Matt Shackman, and he recommended we should just like have a straightforward one, um, one sitcom per episode. And it was a very clean formula that worked so well Otherwise, you end up making a melange of 60s and 50s. We gave it a style, a certain style that people could relate to. You know, anybody that has been um, around, uh, you know, my age earlier, or even like your age, I mean, you're very young. I'm sure you know about the sitcoms. I mean, it's kind of like institutional uh, history of television of, uh, of the United States and the world. Yeah, and it's so incredible that that was something that you had in common with the character of Wanda, which made it such a perfect fit for you. Yeah, I mean, how how ironic, right? That I, I did have the same kind of uh, same kind of influence a little bit about it. Yeah. So, so much of your career as a costume designer has been defined by having to immerse yourself into these totally different and unique worlds that all have different rules, different history than the world that we live in. And to right. me, that, that task can sound pretty intimidating, but... Um, because you have to play such a large role in materializing all of these different worlds. But do you feel like that's where your creativity thrives? Uh, yeah, it, it does. I mean, every costume designer has a, uh, a method of work or a way to work. Uh, for me, I, I take, um, you know, I take influences from uh, anthropology and also I try not to contaminate myself too much watching many other people's work. Although I, you know, I have many uh, people that I absolutely admire as costume designers. I try to give something that is unique to the project I'm working on it. And I tried not to, not to look like, uh, you know, like this or that in, in the, in the case of uh, WandaVision, it was a must, and we had to do that because we had that line that we have to follow. But for the rest of my, you know, body of work, I uh, I like to suggest new, unique 
forms, colors, textures to characters. And I think, and when I suggest this to producers and directors, they like it because I am going to guarantee that this show is going to look a lot different than many of the shows we know. It's good to be different. It's good to have, uh, to take the risk when you're creating something. Um, we tell the stories uh, as well uh, throughout the costumes we design. We help, um, you know, we're an incredible tool for the characters and the storytellers uh, as, you know, directors and all of us that work. We try to convey all that so we can send that message, the, the message that we want to send with this, you know, with a certain project. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It plays such a huge role and you're constantly having to build from the ground up. It's so incredible. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> it's, uh, it's the only way for me. I mean, I, I really design head to toe. I, uh, when I concept the characters and the background, I usually, um, without stepping in anybody's toes as makeup designers or hair designers, I really do believe that the whole look comes from uh, the person that is creating the look of a character. And if I find, uh, you know, collaborators as hair and makeup that they're going in another direction. It starts being a little bit difficult for me. So it, it has to be uh, amalgamated to the character. And that's why we have so many discussions and, you know, uh, we have so many conversations and I try to give as many research and everything. So far it's been great with the uh, hair and makeup designers that I work because they have been... Uh, you know, really contributing to the character rather than from here up. It's another, mm -hmm. you know, kind of a... So for me to concept a character, a tribe, a world, a group of people, an entity, a military, you know, place or whatever, I have to do it complete. Mm -hmm. I just don't go, you know, ah, oh, da, 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 you know, Let's do this kind of style. I mean, I concept everything. I concept, if I have ranks in a military section, I, I, I really illustrate everything from shoes, from back views, from uh, all, any information that I can give to my technicians that are going to help me do this job, you know, of a uh, building because not everything is an illustration. We have to build it and we have to shoot it and feed it and all that. So it's um, it all comes from a point of decision and also inspiration, obviously. You know, inspiration that then I, I propose to the creators of the uh, show and, uh, you know, they can dial down or up or, you know, go sideways or, you know, wherever. Um, it's all, it's all uh, you know, a very incredible genesis of uh, creation. And that's the magic of working in costumes. I think it's a magical career and very satisfying, you know, for, for the soul. When you see uh, your work up there on the screen and you remember everything that you've done for that character and how much it works. This is this is like there's not nothing beats that. It's a it's a great satisfaction. Oh, that's wonderful to hear. Thank you for sharing all of that. Mm -hmm. um, so another question I have for you is that, as I mentioned earlier, as I was uh, introducing you, and we saw in the reel that played before our panel began. Um, that you were the costume designer on the groundbreaking film Avatar which was released in 2009. And there was so much new technology and special effects going on at that time and in that process. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if now in 2021, you know, if you can reflect on what your relationship is or how your relationship as a costume designer has evolved with this technology like CGI. 
aside from like when you have to do gray suits, which is nothing, you know, creative about it. I mean, it's some creative things, but not, it's like, you know, we all call it gray pajamas or green pajamas. When you work in a, in a movie that has that kind of technology, for me, as, as, as my experience hasn't changed because I still build the costumes. Mm-hmm. I still build the costumes because it's an incredible, I build the costumes so the actors can wear it because in post-production, there is so much value added to the post-production having these references. That way, that's why they hire a costume designer so they don't have to figure it out later. There are many movies that they think, oh, let's hire a costume designer and then, you know, uh, they don't finish with uh, the concept of the, of the, of the uh, costumes and they don't build it. Uh, to, uh, you know, to my eyes, these are, this is a big mistake because I'm not being fair to the post-production by not giving these references. When you give a complete costume, that they can just, you know, um, photograph and, uh, you know, they have to reference it later and you giving them the chance to see every strand of uh, every fiber, every feather, every side, uh, you know, angle of this costume, Mm -hmm. uh, what metal value you're using, what color of metal you're using, what color of uh, anything is priceless. Yeah. So, I mean, to answer to your question, it hasn't been different for me with the technology because I still have to work to to uh to build the costume and um any any filmmaker that will that you could ask if they prefer uh just having like a reference tiny reference no given the whole costume, the costume is designed by you and as a costume designer, and there's no better thing to do for a uh, for, uh, for movie when you work with this kind of technologies. I see what you're saying, yeah. So even if what is on the screen was somehow entirely digital, you made that design and you had that as a reference for the people working on it. Absolutely. I mean, those are assets I built for the company and they use it. This is a, sort of like a routine when we work uh, with characters that also uh, uh, later, even though they're not wearing gray pajamas, let's call it gray pajamas, <laughs> the tracking suits uh, for CG, if they're wearing uh, a normal costume, they get still uh, scanned because those characters get to interact with other, you know, CG characters. So they have to be able to track all this down. It's, um, for me, it's, it's, it's like technology, yes, is very welcome, but I still, I'm still building costumes the old fashioned way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, with, uh, with uh, you know, with cutters, with lady cutters and with the, uh, or, you know, cutters, uh, seamstress, tailors, anything, um, buying the fabric, aging the fabric, uh, uh, manipulating the fabric, anything that I have to do for a costume, I'll do it, still do it. So that hasn't changed too for me. I welcome it and I learn every time Every, every time I do another, uh, you know, high-tech movie, I'm always learning, you know, and um, it's never, uh, you know, the technology we use in Avatar or Grey Wall or, you know, even, you know, Apocalypto that we use the, the tiles style, like uh, multiplying many, many costumes. I still have to build thousands of costumes for them to create hundreds of thousands, you see? So, and, and I'm still building the costumes for them and textures and colors and all that. So that doesn't change for a costume designer. Well, thank you for letting me know all of that. That's incredible. Uh, so shifting a little bit, 
you have so much vast experience working on these sort of sci-fi and fantasy films, um, but also period pieces and uh, in period films like Jojo Rabbit. So you're set in World War II Germany, a real place and a real time that is bound by our human history, including fashion history and also historical figures. Do you find those parameters to be more or less challenging than films that are not historical? Nothing is challenging in a, in a project that you are in love with. I mm -hmm. mean, you make it happen. It's challenging. Uh, Maybe money is more challenging. Mm -hmm. Definitely, uh, Jojo was uh, considered, uh, you know, like a decent low budget movie. Let's call it this way. Um, we didn't have, you know, so many people in, the, in our wardrobe department. We had to do so many things by ourselves. When you find a piece of uh, of a costume that is one off. To make it happen, you know, in other kind of movies, it's like, oh my God, one is known, two is one. Do you ever hear of that? That means that uh, you know it's a unique piece. You have to be very, very careful. This is how movies were made uh, always, until we have to do so many multiples. But in it for for Jojo was was the uh, the challenge was to make it unique. And this was more a challenge that came from loving the project and loving the characters and how to make him really unique. So that's uh, that's the challenge there. And working working hard, you work hard uh, either way. But uh, there is some incredible poetry and in working in in the period films because it's like the finding of the piece, of recreating that piece that, uh, that it takes you to, to so many levels of uh, history and uh, research of the past. Listen to so many podcasts uh, from uh, historians, you know, from fashion historians as yourself, and one of the, uh, my assistant designer, Liz Krauss, um, said, Myers, I find this podcast is really, really good. And it was about these two girls, historians, but, and they, uh, we heard the podcast about this, uh, it's, it's, it's a call say that they call it uh, Nazi chic. It's, it was like, oh, what am I gonna listen to this? Yes, of course, we're making movies about Nazi. <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. so it was so good. It was so interesting and so uh, it helped me open my my mind about so many things about you know the fashion of and those times, and also it helped me come to Taika, who always agree about color, mm -hmm. uh, about how to implement these kind of colors into a world that you know that the best we know of it is gray and yeah. green and all that how to how to uh, introduce colors and what colors so that i think that was a successful point for jojo uh the how we utilize the colors into the the scene how to like keyframe it into those wonderful you know uh sets actors and costumes so it was really you know something a lot of fun yeah i will say that it was um it really stood out how how colorful it was and it really was a world that you know so many people would think of as being black and white and drab and um yeah that was a big impression yes yes those colors exist. I mean, uh, they were uh, fashion was colorful back then. It's just uh, you know our collective memories of those times is gray because it's sad. It's gray. It's drab. You know, black and white. <laughs> That's what happens. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, in a very interesting way, Wandavision is uh, or was a design project that combined the fantasy and sci-fi aspects of the Marvel Cinematic Universe 
with period costuming. And I imagine that it must have been really exciting for you to learn that. It was. It was also, uh, you know, a great, a great a deal of trusting our Helmers, which is uh, Matt Shackman and Jack Schaefer, and also our wonderful producers from MCU uh, Studios with uh, Kevin Feige and uh, Luis Desposito, Victoria. They were really, really keen and and. Uh, and guiding us on what was the idea of uh, of Wanda in the period, you know, uh, inspired about these sitcoms, but also at the same time we were introducing later in um, different uh, the, the later of uh, episodes, mm-hmm. you know, a big amount of science fiction because mm-hmm. you know we did the white vision suit, we did. Uh, the beautiful, the WandaVision last costume, you know, battle costume that it was concept by great Andy Park. He illustrated that. And um, the also, you know, the, the other Agatha, we, you know, I was catching, we did that costume with so many depths and so many layers of, of mystery. And I think, when people look at every character of those that sitcom, they were really, really happy about how they fell into every episode. And um, we also, as far as science fiction combined with costumes, uh, we have uh, Monica Rambeau that goes from the 70s and uh, like a full on 70s uh you know the fish pants and the yes. and the waistcoat uh, vest. Uh, it was all my design. It wasn't something that you can actually, uh, you know, purchase. Um, it was uh, the all the fabrics were like hand picked, so we can um, so we can uh, it so they can have that kind of brightness. I mean, even the fish. On on the on the pants were designed by by us, and uh, so yeah. we have to print those in a Euro jersey uh, fabric, and that's how they come out like they're looking so well because it printed wonderful. Uh, but at the same time, also we created uh, you know an astronaut suit, and then we gave uh, like a sort of like modern style to the sword division that it was uh you know kind of a very sleek gray and like a very dark blue kind of colors so the contrast of this coldness with the warmth of what period offers you it was a very good combination yeah i love that you brought up the process of picking the fabric for the fish pants because I actually was going to ask you that question because I love (laughs) the fish pants so much. Her, um, her costume, Tiana Paris's um, costume in those 70s scenes was, it might've been my favorite costume in WandaVision and those fish pants were just incredible. Yeah, they were so much fun. We did uh, so many, um, so many kind of fish that I proposed, and then um, the fish because they were um, it was a like bell bottom. So mm-hmm. I made the fish in the bottom bigger and became uh, they were like a gradation of uh, of sizes from from big to small up to the waist. And that worked really hard, really well because uh, she looked amazing and she rocked them and she loved them. We still get uh, messages from Tayona saying, hey, you know, fans are asking me where I can buy those pants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh so, yeah, I'm sure I'm sure it's going to be great uh, in marketing, uh, you know, for the pants. Yeah, it'll be a great satisfaction knowing that I designed it. It was great. Oh my yeah. God, that's amazing. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Those pants were killer. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask you for the first episode and most of the second episode of WandaVision, 
they were uh, entirely black and white. And as many old Hollywood film enthusiasts know, there were definitely tricks like back in the day for designing her black and white film because the, the colors just don't come across the same way. Um, right. So in what way was that a different experience for you? It was different, but it's like I used like everyday tools as a knife, like an iPhone even. Like if I took a picture of a fabric, then I put it into mono and see how it looks that fabric into black and white. We did that constantly. And uh, also in, incredible communication with Jess Hall, the uh, director of photography and Mark, the production designer about, you know, oh, be careful, let's do, let's do, let's really talk about the what we're going to do in the kitchen because, uh, you know, we don't want to end up with the same color of the wall of the, yeah. you know. I went to the director and I said, I still want to add some lines into her dress that is going to give me some contrast. I'm talking about Wanda kitchen dress, not the dinner dress, but the kitchen dress because... I, I felt that it needed to be outlined almost. And I noticed that because when I saw Agatha, and Agatha has all those contrasts in their you know, black and white costume, I said, oh my God, she's still in the show. She's still in the scene. I have to do something here. I have to like, and then I did it very quickly. Everybody was happy about it. But boy, when she comes through that door with that incredible you know, contrast, check her kind of, uh, you know, dress. There she is. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, we, kept, we kept her in like uh, black and white colors and cream and, and black, you know, always combine a little bit of purple hints. Mm -hmm. One thing that I did for her, I designed this wonderful brush. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. yeah. That it has three ladies, usually like a classical brush cameo is called, um, it will have like three, three graces, but I, uh, because witches always come in three and she was a witch. Mm -hmm. Then I did three witches, you know, almost burning at the stake. It, it was really brilliant. And, and um, I was, uh, she wore that almost in every scene in every episode, except the uh, aerobics episode. Yeah, I'm going to have to rewatch the series and look out for it on her now. <laughs> she has it always here or here or, you know, not lapel or. Yeah, but she always has that. It's, uh, it was like a one Easter egg. It was fantastic. Yeah. Um, also, still staying on episode one of WandaVision, we saw Wanda wearing that beautiful 50s style wedding dress that really looks right out of the 1957 film Funny Face starring Audrey Hepburn. And I'm yes. wondering, why did you choose to align Wanda with Audrey Hepburn in that moment? The circumstances of Wanda's wedding were uh, like an improvisation of things of her life. And I thought that it would be a beautiful thing to have Liz um, and I making an homage to that beautiful dress uh, that, you know, that Audrey Hepburn wore. And the physique that Liz has uh, it just called for it. I mean, we couldn't, I couldn't just be more certain about how she would look that beautiful in that, yeah. in that dress. I mean, it, it is, it is an homage to uh, Miss Audrey Hepburn, but she really rocked it. And, and it's a lot of romanticism about it. It's like a, the perfect little thing for a wedding dress that is not a long dress. And also, it wasn't much to the uh, to the late fifties period, and that uh, it was like an incredible statement I, I wanted to to make with that wedding dress. Yeah, yeah, and I think it certainly aligns with it's her fantasy of what you know the perfect romantic fifties, yes. and that yes. works so perfectly. It's it was like a shanty kind of. Uh, it was like a, like when you do you know whipped cream into something that kind of fluffiness and 
and love. It was beautiful. I have to tell you that the dress I had uh, uh, with my textile locator, Susan Anderson, she mm -hmm. was able to locate almost exact fabric from uh, France. And uh, we had that brought over and it was like an incredible match, you know, from pictures of what we had to do. Just the way that it, you know, it, it made that kind of beautiful bell, you know, of the skirt and the beautiful, very, very tight uh, torso and the boat. Yeah. Uh, a, a neck, a collar that I we made for her. Oh, beautiful. She looked really good. Yeah, it was beautiful. Thanks for noticing my uh, my funny face uh, dress. <laughs> of course, yeah. of course. Um, and you brought up locating textiles, which um, brings me to another question I had for you, because I believe in WandaVision, and I think also in Jojo Rabbit, that you did use some vintage textiles in costuming. Um, and I wanted to ask about sourcing vintage textiles and what you see as being the benefits of using them and then also maybe the challenges of that. Um, the benefits of using the, uh, the you know, period textiles is because they carry an incredible information, basically the the DNA of what made that kind of, of uh, clothes fall the way they fall or have that kind of uh, uh, consistency. It is very important to use the right fabrics. I have an incredible collection for uh, textiles that I, you know, I collect along my travels or just, uh, you know, uh, the different markets I go you know, in Italy or anywhere that I am, I'm always in the look for that because although you don't find big amounts of fabrics, it's a great uh, source of information. If I have to tell, uh, you know, textile locator, please, I have to find this. And then she will locate it and say, oh, yeah, they have it in, uh, in Lyon, France. Uh, yeah. be here next week. Oh, okay, fantastic. This is how it works now with all this communication. But for me, it's basic. I'm making period movies. I need period textiles mm -hmm. if I can find it. Yeah. I also just want to remark on some of Vision's costumes in the, the earlier decades. They were so well fitted. They were so tailored and streamlined. Um, and that's in contrast to, I remember watching in the first episode, the character of Mr. Hart and his yeah. suit so big and loose compared to oh. how how tailored Vision's um, looks were. And I just have to imagine that a lot of fittings and such would have gone into that. Yes, that's very interesting that you mentioned that. Good eye, uh, <laughs> Summer, because uh, Mr. Hart, Mr. Hart was already 60 year old in, the, um, in that scene. That means that he is was a uh, you know a classical man that was more uh, you know wearing like a, a lot earlier fashion than um, than vision. Uh, we wanted to give it that kind of style, maybe late forties, early fifties, mm -hmm. instead of yeah. of uh, of vision wearing like a spot on nineteen fifty nine, nineteen fifty seven, or 1962, 1964, that kind of uh, range of time for fashion period for each character. One ambition were spot on on that period that we wanted to give it. Then older people or different people will have, you know, that kind of licenses. But we did take that license on uh, Mr. Hart, making it more loose, like that, you know, late 40s, 50s. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and also, you know, for me, uh, being a fashion historian, when I'm working on projects, my favorite part is looking at primary sources, going through magazines and newspapers and looking at that material. And I'm wondering for you and also your team, what sorts of sources are you looking at when you're doing that research? 
I'm a book habit of, uh, you know, research. I, uh, uh, there is also something that I've been collecting for a long time. And uh, I do have every book and every fashion period, any anthropological, you know, uh, you know, time and situation of the world. And also lots and lots of uh, fabric textiles, uh, books. I research a lot that I do an incredible, incredible research. And then I go into the world. I don't spend like weeks researching because then you don't do a movie. I do it fast and I do it really concise. So I can, I usually start a movie when I'm on vacation in my house in Italy. Therefore I have like a good support of books, as you can see. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and the and then when I go there, um, I arrive with documents and you know research and everything that I can give to to my assistants. And um, it's a good it's a good uh, starting point, so we can start then going to work, find well you know the materials that we're gonna work with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course, in WandaVision, you you did have so much source material in those. TV sitcoms and such that were also huge inspirations for that. Totally, yeah. So how lucky is that? I mean, oh, well, somebody already laid it up for you and you yeah. get a lot of recognition for it. It's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, it's such a unique project and it, it's yeah. like such a perfect fit for you. And that's, that's how things work out sometimes. It's incredible. I know, eh? yes, yes, it's true. Um, something else I, I'm curious about, because, of course, we're um, looking at Comic-Con, is that you have um, designed on so many films, you know, fantasy, sci-fi films, um, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, where there are so many beloved characters and characters that people love to cosplay. And I'm just wondering how it makes you feel to see cosplayers recreate some of those costumes that you've uh, designed for. Oh my God! And my my heart goes warm when uh, when I see a cosplayer, uh, you know, recreating a costume the best. And I also always give them lots of kudos, you know, when uh, they send me their pictures and say, "Why you think that I you did fantastic? This is great." I mean, uh, they've been cosplaying so many of my costumes, uh, even like you know, John Carter. Of Mars, they uh, cosplay a lot of digital stories, the wedding dress. I don't know if you know this dress I made, a design. And Hela, uh, you know, uh, now Wanda, Wanda, classic Wanda, and classic vision, you know, with those bright, bright colors from the comic books. Um, um, Thor, uh, Korg, uh, name it, uh, Valkyrie, uh, it's like they just love recreating the costumes, and and for me, it's it's like if some, when somebody gives you a bouquet of flowers, I get the same feeling when cosplayers recreate my costumes. It's really, it's, it's so much fun, uh, so much recognition. And regarding Thor Ragnarok, uh, I I read an interview with you where you're talking about just in general, the concept of you, you have the costume design in mind for a character given, you know, what the writers have given you and what you know about the mm -hmm. character. But uh, for example, in the case of, I believe you said that when Jeff Goldblum was cast as the grand master, that that also influenced maybe changed a little bit of the costume just based off of who he was as an actor and his vibe i believe you said you then kind of gave it more of a loungewear feel it was very well uh explained by kevin uh, kevin feige and and taika what they wanted to do they wanted to portray a super um a, a lovable tyrant mm -hmm. with uh, an incredible uh you know bomb bound uh, feeling about it, but uh, you know, it's, uh, it's 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 something some lovable, horrible person you hate to love, and 
Mm-hmm. And um, he's nonchalant. Everybody's like in chaos. And he's like, oh, but, you know, okay, I'm going to kill him. And uh, he's asymmetric. And uh, he wearing one of those almost a smoking jacket with a gold lame. And uh, it was so much fun. And then if you add all these to bring in Jeff Goblin, wow. Yeah, it's, it was like a... a you know, it was a, a win-win situation when we just, uh, it was amazing. He became such an adorable, uh, you know, character for the MCU. Um, yeah. Yeah. Really great. Very happy. So, Mayas, I have one last question for you, and that is... Um, Essentially, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it's been so tough on so many productions, uh, including WandaVision, which had been in production, and then it halted once the pandemic began. So, you know, in in what ways did the pandemic change the course of your work on WandaVision? And also, how is it, um, how's the pandemic affecting your current projects? Well, WandaVision last two episodes were shot in uh, in Los Angeles and uh, it was uh, after we all had to stop for lockdown it has been it, it, it was really challenging it was really challenging uh, for my crew for actors for you know producing the costumes for getting tested constantly living in fear of course it was really really tough in the second tour I did in Australia, Thor Love and Thunder, we were nestled within the, you know, Australian continent where there were almost no cases. I mean, one or two cases of uh, of uh, COVID um, in the time that I was there in Sydney. They were in some other places like Victoria. There were some restrictions of that between the borders really didn't affect us that much for that for that uh, show but the one that suffered i'm mean, like as well as like over every other project that i was working throughout covid 19 first round and um yeah it was uh it was tough but we did it so <laughs> that's this and the actors did it and uh there is one scene in uh, at the cafe that I think they were they have the magic show, and I almost I almost feel that like it was almost too too clear that it was social distance how we placed the <laughs> the extras they were like almost two meters apart and and that is something to say they look good but yeah. but you know if it wasn't for because. What happened with COVID? They, it was inevitable, an inev- inevitable thing to to really notice. Yeah. yeah, such a good point. It, no, it did not um, come off as strange to me, but maybe that's just because that's how tables look these days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, well, that is all the time we have today. Mayas, thank you so, so much for your time. This was so wonderful. Uh, and thank you thank for you so much. all of your yeah. amazing work and congratulations again. Uh, so well-deserved. Thank yeah. you so much. It has been my pleasure talking to you, Summer. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And thank you to the Costume Designers Guild and our Comic-Con partner, Milt and Edie's Dry Cleaning and Tailoring Center, and to Ingle Dodd Media for making this happen. And um, again, thank you to everyone watching, and we'll see you again soon. Bye.